In this video, we talk about the instrumentation that we're going to use for the watershed of trees, MIWI. We'll begin with the anchor phenomenon. Does the presence or absence of trees create a measurable difference in physical environmental parameters, such as temperature and moisture, in an outdoor area? At the core of this investigation is measuring temperature three ways, measuring the air temperature, the soil temperature, and the temperature of the land surface. In order to understand the role of the presence or absence of trees, we're going to select two identical sites, and the only parameter that we're going to change is the amount of sunlight that the site receives. So one site will be sunny, and a second nearby site will be shady. To make these three different temperature measurements, we'll use three different types of thermometers. We have an infrared thermometer for surface temperature, we have two soil thermometers for soil temperature at two depths, and a sling psychrometer that will give us the air temperature and allow us to calculate the relative humidity and dew point. Let's begin with the surface temperature because it's the simplest measurement. For all of our experiments, it's important to know the date and time of day as well as the location of the field sites. And it's useful as well to note the sky cover. Is it sunny, overcast, stormy? On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see me holding the infrared thermometer, pointing it at the land surface and reading the temperature in Celsius. One thing to note is that before you start making measurements, you should decide which temperature scale you're going to use. For almost all science applications, I would choose Celsius, but in this case, since most of us are so hardwired to talk about air temperature in Fahrenheit, I think it's okay to use that or to record the data in both temperature units. For the soil temperature, we have two metal stem soil thermometers. Make sure they're both reading the same temperature before you begin. They should have a little calibration nut on the back of the dial that you can adjust with a small wrench if you need to match the two thermometers. Insert one thermometer about one inch or two centimeters into the soil and the other eight inches or 20 centimeters. Make sure you've chosen a site with pretty soft soil that makes it easy to both insert and then retrieve the soil thermometers. Give them a moment to equilibrate with their new surroundings and record the two temperatures. I'll show you the soil temperature measurements at both sites here before we move on to the air temperature and relative humidity. These are the two measurements at the sunny site, 28 Celsius at one inch and 22 Celsius at eight inches. When students are working on their data analysis, they'll wanna graph these measurements. Here I'm showing the two data points as a soil temperature profile, where I've arranged the graph axes to reflect the physical space of the subsurface with depth on the y-axis increasing downward and temperature on the x-axis. This graph also includes the air temperature, which we'll measure in just a minute, plotted at a depth of zero. Here are the two temperatures at the shady site, 21 Celsius at one inch and 19 Celsius at eight inches, and a graph of those data as well. And here are both sites side by side for comparison. It's easy to see that at both sites the surface temperature is warmer than the deep soil and that the sunny site is warmer at all depths than the shady site. Pull the thermometers out carefully when you're done with lots of wiggling and maybe with some help from the small wrench or vice grips that you use to calibrate the thermometer. To measure the air temperature and relative humidity, we'll use a sling psychrometer. This consists of two identical thermometers mounted together. One thermometer wears a little cotton sock that will thoroughly soak in water. The first thermometer, referred to as the dry bulb, records the air temperature. The cotton sock on the second thermometer acts as a small water reservoir around the wet bulb. When we spin the psychrometer around, water evaporates to achieve equilibrium with the water vapor in the surrounding air. As it evaporates, energy leaves the system, cooling the thermometer and reducing the wet bulb temperature. We're going to use the sling psychrometer to make measurements in two different locations. This one which is forested, has a lot of vegetation. And so let's get the little sock wet. Here's what it looks like to use a sling psychometer. We might have to spin it two or three times for 30 seconds each. We want the temperature and of the wet bulb to stabilize. Whirl this around for about 30 seconds and see how we do. I've put the measurements that I made at this location at the bottom of the image both wet bulb and dry bulb, along with the surface temperature that I measured here. Okay. All right, welcome to the high school parking lot, which is obviously really open space. We get our soft wet, and because it's a little bit sunny, I'm gonna have to try 
try to shade the thermometer with my body. For the next location, I'm going to show you a third type of site that's really interesting to look at, a paved surface. Obviously, I can't do the soil temperature measurements here, but since so much of our built environment includes paved surfaces like this, it's a great supplemental site to add to the first two. And take a look at the temperature of the pavement, and recall that the surface temperature in the shade was 72 Fahrenheit, not the 114 that we see here. With these data, we can also compute the relative humidity. Some sling psychrometers include a humidity slide rule as part of the instrument case. Here I'm showing you the relative humidity for the shady site, 76%. We can also use a table to find relative humidity, and if we want, the dew point, the temperature where water vapor in saturated air condenses to liquid. The humidity chart has dry bulb temperatures running horizontally and wet bulb temperatures vertically. We find the two temperatures we've measured and read the relative humidity off the chart, 76%. We do the same for our sunny site measurements, 67%. With the air temperature and the relative humidity, we can also look up the heat index, which is a measure of the heat that our bodies have to accommodate. The heat index includes both temperature and humidity because the high humidity makes it more difficult for us to cool down by sweating, which is our natural defense against extreme heat. You can see here that even though the relative humidity was lower in the parking lot, the higher temperature and thus higher heat index puts us in a zone of extreme caution for outdoor activities. When students look at data like this from a sunny summer day, they're very well prepared to think about the role of trees in their local environment. Their data point to two functions of trees, first to cool the environment by blocking sunlight seen in their surface temperature data, and second, by moving heat out of the environment by transpiration of water vapor, seen in their humidity data. And of course, trees work indirectly to improve climate by helping us use less energy to combat extreme heat.